Taryn ran, runs to Gwydion. And Gwydion says, sheath the blade, sheath the blade. Okay, sorry. Gwydion's face was drawn and pale. How have you drawn this? My hands alone dare touch it. Give me the sword. And Taryn's like, yeah, maybe not. Quickly, will you destroy what I have fought to win? Really? How much has Gwydion fought to win in what we've seen? He hasn't done much. You will share with me in it, pig keeper. I trust no other. Now that doesn't sound like Gwydion, you know, in terms of doling out treasure. Reaches out his hand for the sword. Taryn flings back. This is not the counsel of a friend. It is betrayal. And only then did he understand the ruse. And he realizes it's Iran. Before he can strike him, Iran flees. And Nocrin says, Escape you, pig keeper, but not my vengeance. The secret chambers of Iran are no secret to me. I shall seek him out wherever he has taken refuge. And there is a spidery figure up on the throne, Meg. Meg says, No closer. Will you keep your lives to your knees then? Humble yourselves, beg mercy. I, Mag, shall favor you by making me, making you my slaves. What does Mag not realize at this point? That's just him. Yeah. That, you know, he's lost. And this is back like uh, in the, when was this? The second Iraq war, when U.S. troops were almost into Baghdad. You know, Saddam Hussein getting on the TV and saying, if you leave now, I'll let you win. Or if you leave now, I will let you live. He didn't have much say in the matter at that point. Okay. Taryn, your master has abandoned you. Your own treachery has ended. He strides forward. Meg says, I am master. Taryn looks to Fluter and says, he's gone crazy. Ocran says, no, he won't be prisoner. Taryn, let him find justice from Gwydion. And... Mag 218, do you tell me Iran's promises are lies? It was promised I should wear this. He has the crown. Mag, Mag the Magnificent, Mag the Death Lord, puts the crown on his head, glows like red fire in a forge, writhing in agony. Mag clutches vainly at the burning metal, which had now turned white hot, and it essentially melts his head away. Okay. Meanwhile, Gurgi and Glue are what? They're down in the winding corridors, finding, we find out a little bit later, the treasure house. Okay? And Glue wants to try to take as much as he can. Bottom of 219, Gurgi says, no, no, it cannot be yours, greedy giant. It is for mighty prince to give or take. That is Gwydion. So he says, we must go find Gwydion. Um, they find the real Gwydion. And top of 221, Taryn offers him the sword. You've earned the right to draw it, assistant pig keeper, thus the right to wear it. All right. It was magnificent the way he struck down that cauldron born, says Fluter. A flam couldn't have done better. We're rid of those foul brutes forever. Taryn, yet I hate them no longer. Why? He just pities them. Yeah. It was not their wish to bend in slavery to another's will. Notice, they had no choice in the matter. You could say, <laughs> I'll go out on a limb here. You could say, you know, slaves have a choice in the matter. They could choose not to and die. The cauldron born don't even, do, don't even have that choice. Okay? They're just forced to do whatever. Because there's... Let's say a cauldron born was named Fred, because Fred's not there anymore. Fred's gone. It's just the animated body that does it. Now they are at peace, Taryn says. Okay. Fluter says, I still haven't heard any stone singing, though. How, how can the prophecy come true? Taryn, top of the mountain. It was like a voice. Then when I saw how hollowed and eaten away it was, I believed I might be able to move it. The voiceless stone spoke clearly. Okay. So, 222. Ocran throws 
Aran at Taryn's feet. Ocran flung herself at Taryn's feet. Taryn gasped. Frozen horror behind him coiled a serpent ready to strike. Taryn sprang aside. Derwin flashes from its scabbard. Ocran had clutched the serpent in both hands as though to strangle Taryn asunder. The head of the snake darted toward her. Fangs get into her throat. She falls back and Taryn chops it in two. Okay. And she says to Gwydion, have I not kept my oath? Is the Lord of Anubin slain? It is good. My death comes easily upon me. And her body sags in Gwydion's arms. Why is that significant? She wanted him as her lover. Okay? Fluter says, look at the sword. Because as he gasped, as Terran grasped the hilt, page 223, the flame of Derwin flickered as though stirred by wind. The white brilliance dimmed like a dying fire, faster than the glow faded, no longer white, but filled with swirling colors. Pretty soon, Terran's hand held no more than a scarred and battered weapon whose blade glinted dully, not from the flame that had once burned within it, but only from the mirrored rays of the setting sun. Derwin only, Derwin only had power while Iran lived. Its whole purpose was to defeat Iran. Okay? So there's writing on it. Ailami pulls out her bobble so they can read the writing. And it's fading. Draw Dernwin, bottom of 223, only thou of noble worth, to rule with justice to strike down evil, who wields it in good cause, shall slay even the Lord of Death. Which is exactly what's been done. So Gwydion says, Dernwin's task is ended. Will it ever shine like the sun again? Nope. nope. Has no purpose to. So, they make their way back home. Terran sees, calls Garden, misses him, and we're told 227 and following, bottom of 227. Um, he says, there's one task that remains. Gwydion says this. The sons of dawn, their kinsmen and kinswomen, must board the golden ships and set sail for the summer country, the land from which we came. Terence's like, what? I mean, Pridain has just been saved. I, he assumes Gwydion is going to stay and rule. How then? The sons of dawn leave Pridain. Must you sail now? To what purpose? When will you return? Won't you rejoice in your victory? He says, that's the reason for the voyage. This is a destiny long ago laid upon us. When the Lord of Anu and shall be overcome, then must the sons of dawn depart forever. <laughs> Alonri, no! We cannot run from this ancient destiny. Notice, fate can't be fled from. Fluter Flam, too. He's kin. He says, no, I think I'm going to stay here in my own realm. Taliesin, you don't get to choose. Okay? Son of Godo, but know that the summer country is a fair land, fairer even than Pradain, and one where all hearts' desires are granted. So what does the summer country sound like? Heaven. It's heaven, man. It's paradise. Leon shall be with you, a new harp you shall have. I myself shall teach you the playing of it. You shall learn all the lore of the bards. In other words, you wanted to be a bard, now you're going to be the greatest bard there ever was. Your heart has always been the heart of a true bard, Fluter Flam. Until now, it was unready. Have you not given up that which you love most for the sake of your companions? Because he doesn't have a harp anymore, right? The harp that awaits you shall be all the more precious, and its strings shall never break. He says, also, all, born men, all men born must die, except for those who dwell in the summer country. You go there and you live forever. It is a land without strife or suffering where even death itself is unknown. Dalvin says, yeah, but there's something else, too. As the sons of dawn must return to their own land, so must there come an end to my powers. So enchantment is also going to go away. 
Not only shall the flame of Durnwin be quenched and its power vanish, all enchantments shall pass away. And men unaided guide their own destiny. Kind of like at the end of the Lord of the Rings, where the elves pass over, leave Middle Earth, so that here, which is Middle Earth, but a lot later, there aren't elves. Or those that there are, they're very hard to find and or see. So he continues and says, I too am going to the summer country. I do so with sorrow, but with even greater joy. He says, I'm old. And for me, there shall be rest and laying down of burdens. Dolly also will go. Why? Because King Adeleg will soon command the barring of all passages into his kingdom. Just as Meduin has already closed his valley forever to the race of men. So, if somebody were to go off to Pridain today, they wouldn't be able to get into Meduin's valley. Nor would they be able to get into the hidden country of the fair folk. Fair folk are elves. Okay? There are still people in Great Britain, England, etc. who think there are such things as leprechauns and fairies and elves, and etc. Dalvin. And Alonwi's going too. Why? She's from a race of enchanters. So it must be. And she, you know, was like, the hell with this, I get it say. At Karakalur, the princess gave up only the usage of her magical powers. They are still within her, as they have been handed down to all the daughters of the House of Lear. Therefore must she depart. There are others. He says. Notice he's just kind of opening the boat to everybody who wants to go. Gurgi can go. Gurgi's not even human. We don't even know what Gurgi is. Henwin too. Got to have bacon. And Taryn <laughs> of Kira, sorry, Taryn of Caradalbin. Even you can go. Gurgi. Yes, yes, go all. Oh, go to land of no sightings and no dying. Gurgi's probably thinking one of the things... Endless food. Endless food, man. I'll never be hungry. Terran's heart leapt as he cried out Alonwi's name and hastened to the side of the princess. And he says, we'll never be apart. In the summer country, we shall be wed. If you will wed. And she says, well, of course. And he says, can this be true? It's like somebody pinched me. I'm living a dream. Live forever in a land of perfect happiness, no sorrow, Glue, well, that's all very well. Bestowing never-ending life right and left. Glue, was, did Dalvin say glue? You get to come to lack of consideration. It's plain that if that fair folk mine hadn't come tumbling down, robbing me of my fortune, Durnwood would never have been found. The cauldron born never slain. What's glue doing? I should be able to go. If it weren't for me, he never would have found the damn sword. No, no, go, by all means, leave us here. Gurgi, yes, yes, whining a giant, too, has served. Dalvin, you're right, even Blue has served. His reward shall be no less. In the summer country he may grow, if he so desires, to the stature of a man. That is, a real man, not a midget. Sorry, I don't mean to be offensive to midgets. But do you tell me, he looks at Gurgi, he saved your life? Glue, of course he didn't, said the former giant. A life was saved, mine. If he hadn't pulled me out of the treasure house, I'd be no more than a cinder in a new one. And Glue finally tells the truth, Fluter says. Okay. So that night, <coughs> Taryn doesn't sleep well. Why not? He's in trouble. Yeah, but he gets the girl, he gets to go off to heaven, he gets, you know. But he's not done in the world. And he hears a voice. What, sleepless, my chicken? Light fills the chamber, dazzling him, and he sees three tall and slender figures. Swimsuit noddles, not the ugly old hags who live by the marshes of Morva. Two garbed in robes of shifting colors of white, gold, and flaming crimson, one hooded in a cloak of glittering black. Terrence saw their faces were calm, beautiful to heartbreak, and though the dark hood shadowed the features of the last, 
Tara knew she could be no less fair. Sleepless and speechless? He says, I know you, but you can't be. Ordu? Orwin? Orgok? That's us. You mustn't think we look like ugly old hags all the time. Only when the circumstances seem to require it. Why are you here? Are you going to the summer country? <coughs> Notice the enigmatic answer. We are journeying, though not with you. They're going somewhere else. Orwin says, you'll never see us again, nor will we see you. We shall miss you. Ordu, meanwhile, unfolded a length of brightly woven tapestry, and she holds it out to Tara. What is it? It's the weaving she had been doing. Okay. What is it? It's Taryn's life. It's his life. Okay. We came to bring you this. Take it and pay no heed to Orgok's grumbling. She'll have to swallow her disappointment for lack of anything better. Taryn says, I've seen this on your loom. Why do you give it to me? It's yours. It does come from our loom, but it was you who wove it. He's like, huh? And he looked more closely at the fabric, 234. Saw it crowded with images of men and women, warriors, battles, birds, animals. These are of my own life. The pattern is your choosing and always was. What? My choosing, not yours. Yet I believed. What did he believe? That they are what? The three fates. And that they wove his life. And he says, yes, once I did believe the world went at your bidding. I see now it is not so. The strands of life are not woven by three hags or even by three beautiful damsels. The pattern indeed was mine. But here, here, it's unfinished. Well, why? Because he's still alive. Yeah, he's still alive. He's got to live out the rest of his life and do what? Make choices and act upon them. She says, you must choose the pattern, and so must each of you poor perplexed fledglings, as long as thread remains to be woven. Taryn, but I don't see mine. That is, I don't see my path. I no longer understand my heart. Why does my grief shadow my joy? Tell me this. Give me to know this. She says, when did we give you anything? No, we're not going to give you this. You've got to solve the answer yourself. So he stares there that whole night at the window. Why? He's thinking things over. Why at the window? What's he looking out at? The world. More specifically, the called garden. Is that garden going to plant itself? Is it going to till itself? Is it going to, after it tills itself and plants itself, reap it? No, it won't. And he wakes up. He goes out to the others. They're all looking at him, watching him. He looks at Gwydion. He looks at Dalbin. And he says, Never shall I have greater honor than the gift you offer me. What's the gift? Summer country, live forever, marry Ilanwi, never grow old. Last night, my heart was troubled. I dreamed that Oru, no, it was not a dream. She was indeed here. And I've seen for myself, your gift is one I cannot take. The companions start. And Alonwi says, Taryn of Kira Dobbin, do you have any idea what you're saying? What's she thinking? She's crazy. Yeah. You are flipping crazy, man. We could have everything. We could have the perfect, you know, who has had a perfect life? Nobody. We could have perfection here. She goes, oh, I get it. I get it. We are going to get married. That's it. You don't want me. You don't love me anymore. You question your heart. It has not changed. It is your heart that has changed toward mine. You were wrong, Princess of Lear. I have long loved you and loved you even before I knew that I did. If my heart breaks to part from our companions, it breaks twice over to part from you. Yet so it must be. I cannot do otherwise. Okay? Notice what he's giving up. He's giving up happiness. What he's sacrificing. 
happiness, contentment. Dobbin, you better think carefully, boy. Once taken, your choice cannot be recalled. Why not? They're not going to come back for him. Okay. Why else? You can't ever recall, or you can't ever take back a choice. That is, if I choose to drop that marker, just because I pick it up again, doesn't mean I can take back that choice. That act of dropping the marker has now happened. It can never be unhappened. Okay? Same thing with any choice that is acted on. Whatever the choice is, you choose a major. Most of you probably are going to choose another major. And some of you, if you're odd like me, you're going to end up going through, you know, like a catalog of majors. I think I was, by the time I graduated, I had seven different majors by the time I graduated. I was on the seven-year plan. Took a year off, worked, got married, you know, took a semester off, etc. He says, will you dwell in sorrow instead of happiness? Where is sorrow? Pridane. Happiness. Summer country. Will you refuse not, on, not only joy and love, but never ending life? Come on, kid. You serious? You really going to give up that? Notice, Taryn did not answer for a long moment. He's got to think about that one now. There are others, there are those more deserving of your gift than I, yet never may it be offered them. There's a passage in the Lord of the Rings where at the beginning of the, of the novel, where the wizard Gandalf is talking with Frodo, and they're talking about Gollum. And Frodo says, Gollum deserves death. He is just an enemy. He says he just deserves death. He, um, Gollum is just an enemy. He deserves death. And Gandalf says, deserves it? I dare say he does. There are many who live that deserve death. And some die that deserve life. Can you give it to them? Then be not too quick to deal out death in judgment. For not even the very wise can see all ends. So what does he mean there? Just because he doesn't deserve it, he doesn't want the experience to choose. Okay. But he's also saying, it's not your decision who dies and who doesn't. Why? It's because fate may have something in store for them. Possibly. What if you're wrong? I used to be full board, capital punishment, all in support of now I'm almost completely the opposite. For one, one reason, among others, the number of cases that have been proven over the last 20 years where people were put to death innocently. One is too many. One, because as Gandalf says, can you give it to them? Many die who deserve to live. Can you bring it back? No, you cannot. Taryn, there are those more deserving of your gift than I, yet never may it be offered to them. Who's he thinking of? Call, Rune, Anlaw, Lanio, many others. Call, son of Colfer's garden, orchard, lie barren, waiting for a hand to quicken them. My skill is less than his, but I give it willingly for his sake. That is, I will never be the gardener he will be. He was. But I'll do my damnedest. The seawall at Dennis Ridden is unfinished. Before the king of Mona's burial mound, I vowed not to leave his task undone. Taryn pulls out the little piece of pottery. Shall I forget Anlaw Clay Shaper? Comet Marin and others like it? I cannot restore life to Lania, son of Longwin, who had seven children, I think, and one on the way. Yeah. I think it was six. Man. Six children, one on the seven. way. And those valiant folk who followed me, 
never to see their homes again. Notice, he doesn't say they followed you, Gideon. They followed me. Their deaths are on Terran's mind. Nor can I mend the hearts of widows and orphaned children. Yet if it is in my power to rebuild even a little of what has been broken, this must I do. How can he rebuild even a little? Not staying there in Caradolphin. He'll start there. <laughs> he must go out into the world. Yeah, he's got to go back to the free commons and do what he can to do what? Rebuild. Rebuild? What else? Renew. What else? What about the pain and sorrow of the wives and the children? Try to help them through it. Alleviate their pain. Can he fully remove their pain? No, nope, he cannot. But he's saying, I can try. The red fallows once were a fruitful place with labor. Perhaps they shall be so again. He looks at Taliesin. Kirdathel's proud halls lie in ruins, and with them the hall of lore and the treasured wisdom of the bards. Have you not said that memory lives longer than what it remembers? But what if memory be lost? If there are those who will help me, we will raise the fallen stones and regain the treasure of memory. Gurgi Wild, he will not voyage. No, no, he stays always, you know. Terence says, Nope, you must journey with the others. Do you call me master? Then obey me. Find the wisdom you yearn for. In other words, fully become human is kind of what he's saying. Stop being this quasi-human, quasi-beast thing and become what you're fully meant to be. It awaits you in the summer country. In other words, Gurgi, you will become what you want to be. You will be all you can be, to quote one of the branches of the military. Whatever I may find, I must seek it here. In other words, Terrence saying, I'm not going to find my fulfillment, my completion off there. Nor is he going to find it in Ilan. He's going to find it in doing what? Quote, unquote, good works here. Ilan, we bows her head. You have chosen as you must, Terrence of Care Dalbin. Dalvin, and I'm not going to disagree with you, but I will warn you. The tasks you set yourself are cruelly difficult. I mean, the Red Fallows, how long has it been the Red Fallows? Years, decades. There is no certainty you will accomplish even one. What if you fail at every one, Taryn? Then he'll die with what on his lips? Regret. I don't think so. At least I tried. He will have tried. He will have done his best. In either case, your efforts may well go unrewarded, unsung, forgotten. That is, don't think somebody's going to raise a great big statue, a great big memorial to you because of what you attempted. You might die completely unknown. And at the end, like all mortals, you must face your death, perhaps without even a mound of honor to mark your resting place. That is, remember, you will die. That is, you won't get to do all this and then, you know, Send a pigeon to the summer country and try to... You will die. And there might not even be a mark showing where you died. So be it. Long ago I learned, excuse me, long ago I yearned to be a hero without knowing the truth what a hero was. What did he mean? I yearned to be a hero. War, glory, honor. Where do glory and honor, when he was a child, come from? Battle. From the sword. Keep going. Uh, when Dalvin told like stories of, of Gideon and all 
They come from other people talking about you. That's what he wanted. He wanted the honor of other people going, look, there's Taryn of Caradolphin, the heroic figure. Without knowing in truth what a hero was. How without knowing in truth? Because he worked every day side by side with the hero. Call. Now perhaps I understand it a little better. A grower of turnips, or a shaper of clay, a comet farmer, or a king. Every man is a hero. What? If he strives more for others than for himself alone. Remember what he learned when he looked into the mirror of Lunet? He says, I saw myself. I saw aspirations, things I wanted to do. And things I hadn't done. He saw good, some, bad, more. What did he see? I'm a man like every other man. <laughs> Yet, unique. Intentions that he hadn't fulfilled, some that he had. So what does he say? What's a hero? A man if he strives more for others than for himself alone. First book. He wants to be a hero. He wants to make a sword. Why? For himself. He jumps into the thorn bush thinking what? To save Gwydion. Gwydion's in danger. He's not thinking of himself. He rescues the Gwythaint, not thinking of himself. Okay? Everything else he does throughout the books, he's doing for others. Once, he looks at Dalvin. Uh, sorry. You told me that the seeking counts more than the finding. So too must the striving count more than the gain. Which is why I said to your comment about, you know, what's he going to have on his lips on his deathbed? I at least tried. That's the striving. The success or not comes as a result of what? Whether you're a successful gardener or not, is that entirely... Dependent upon your actions, tilling the ground, planting the, planting the seeds, weeding, etc. No, what else has to happen? Sky's got to rain. You plant a garden in Death Valley, guess what? It ain't going to grow. I've driven through Death Valley a number of times. Ain't nothing grows. Unless they get a monsoon that comes in. And then that entire valley floor bursts into bloom. Things come up overnight and bud and flower and they'll stay like that for a day or two and then it's 120 degree, degrees again and it's gone. Okay? Once I hoped for a glorious destiny. He goes on. That dream has vanished with my childhood. And though a pleasant dream it was fit only for a child. I am well content as an assistant pig keeper. Dalvin, even that contentment shall not be yours. <laughs> You're not assistant pig keeper. Why? Well, for one reason, pig's going off to the, you know, promised land. Where it's never going to become bacon. <laughs> but what else does Dalvin say? That he has to be high king. You're no longer assistant pig keeper, but I king. Now that's a pretty damn good, you know, promotion. Uh, promotion, yeah. A bit of a pay raise. My wife was talking to my son yesterday. The gal who cuts her hair, you know, told my son something about, you know, bringing his resume in. Her husband has a business. And I don't remember what, how they got around, you know. But said something about, and he's looking for employees and something about 120 grand a year. And I was like, uh, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, my son doesn't want to do it. Taryn, you jest with me. Have I been prideful that you would mock me by calling me king? What's in Taryn's mind? This guy's joshing me right now. Okay, what else? Who can become king? Nobly born. Only someone nobly born. Only someone you know their parents. Your worth was proved when you drew Dernwin from its sheath. And your kingliness 
when you chose to remain here. Notice what Dalbin is saying about kingliness. What should a king do? Think about people. Think about others. Yeah. Shakespeare's great play, King Lear, is all about a guy who, towards the end of his life, you know, he's tired of being king. And so he says, I'm going to divide up my kingdom among my three daughters. Here I, here's how I'm going to divide it up. Whoever loves me the most, they get the biggest piece of the pie. So, eldest, eldest daughter, how much do you love me? And she lies through her teeth and says, okay, you get this part. So, daughter number two, how much do you love me? And she gets this part. So, daughter number three, how much do you love me? I love you no more than a daughter ought to love her father. Try that again. I love you no more than a daughter ought to love her father. Nothing more? That is, you don't lo love me any more than that? No. Change your answer, because nothing comes from nothing. If you don't love me anything more than that, then you're not getting anything. She's like, listen, my sisters are lying to you. They say you have all their love, yet they're both married. What about their husbands? I'm not married yet, but I hope to be. And guess what? When I get married, I'm going to love my husband. That's not love due to you. I love you as a daughter ought to love her father. What's she saying? Basically, she's trying to spread her love out, and people are only going to get fortunate. Then. Well, no. She's saying, in terms of my relationship to you as Daughter, you have all my love as a daughter owes to her father. My husband will have all my love as a wife owes to her husband and such. And he comes to realize later when he goes crazy, well, that was a pretty stupid thing to do on my part, you know, because he disowns her, nearly has her killed and such. And he comes to this one scene in the play, it's act three, where he's out in the middle of a storm. I mean just rock and roll storm. Because the other two daughters won't put him up for the night. The third daughter is off somewhere else. And he comes to this realization. You know, I'm not the only one out in this storm. There are poor people out in this storm. There are people with no houses out in this storm. Therefore, I'm going to stay out in the storm. To feel what it is like to be homeless. And he says, you know, when I was king, I should have thought more about this. Shakespeare does that with a lot of his characters who start off as pompous asses. They kind of have to look in the mirror, come to wrestle with themselves. What happens at the end? He dies. He does, dies. Does his third daughter ever? His daughter dies. Oh, okay. A guy in the 18th century revised the play because he thought, this isn't right. They shouldn't die. Lear lives and his daughter lives. And he goes on and lives out the rest of his life. No, it's a, I mean, it's one of Shakespeare's tragedies. I highly recommend seeing it. Okay? Taron, uh, excuse me, Dalbin says, you, um, you demonstrated your kingliness when you chose to remain here. It is not a gift I offer you now but a burden far heavier than any you have borne. In other words, you're thinking, King, I can call the shots. Remember the other day I talked about another one of Shakespeare's plays? The Henry IV plays, where it's either Henry IV or Richard II refers to the crown as the hollow crown. People think, oh, the crown, it's this great and wonderful thing to have, because then you have all the power. And the king says, it's hollow. It's a symbol. What, it, what is it really? It's a headache. It's a headache having to deal with the problems of everybody. Taryn, then why must I bear it? If it's a burden, oh, no, I don't want it. I'm just an assistant pig keeper. Okay, him can go off. I'll be, I'll, I'll assist and pig keep another pig. And such have I always been. Dalvin, it's written in the book of three. Dared not tell you this. To give you such knowledge would have defeated the prophecy itself. Well, there's a little problem there. Because if it's really a prophecy, it can't be defeated. 
He's saying, Taryn, if I told you back in the first book, the prophecy says, you will become the high king. What would have Taryn done? Probably nothing that he did in books two through four. Why? Because he got, went on thinking that he'd just become high king. Yeah, why do anything? I mean, if you are told, if I told Collins, guess what? You are fated to be president. I'd probably sit back there and go, well, okay then. Let's just let the good times roll and I'll just sit here and do nothing and let that happen. Well, I mean, unless it specifies what he's high king of because he could have done nothing and then everything would have been just dead and gone and he'd been high king of deaths. Well, if it's in the book of three, it's kind of implied high king of all per day. To give you such knowledge would have defeated the prophecy itself. Until this very moment, I was not sure you were the one chosen to rule. Yesterday, I feared you were not. Well, what's the difference between yesterday and today? Yesterday, he's ready to get to the summer country. Today, he's wanting to stay in for day. Yeah, he spent the whole night awake. Doing what? Deciding over what he wanted to do. Deciding? Or thinking, I owe these people. I mean, his night awake was his garden of Gethsemane. Taryn, could the book of three deceive you? <laughs> could you be wrong? No, could not. This book is thus called because it tells all three parts of our lives. Past, present, future. But it could as well be called a book of if. Why? What did he learn by looking at the weaving Ordu showed him? His decisions do what? Weep the, uh, weave the warp and woof of the fabric of his life. Okay. Dalvin says, could as well be called a book of if. If you had failed at your tasks, if you had followed an evil path, if you had been slain, if you had not chosen as you did. A thousand ifs, my boy. Where does the first if begin? If he had decided to go off after Henwin after she ran into the woods. If you had not been such a pain in the ass to call by saying, I want to make a sword, you know. In many times a thousand. Think in all the books, especially Terran Wanderer, how many times he could have turned back. Oh, like through the whole book. Yeah. The book of three can say no more than if until at the end. Of all things that might have been, one alone becomes what really is. What does he mean? Think of choices. Think of decisions that you make in life. Whether big major decisions or little tiny decisions, like what clothes to put on in the morning. It is a decision. It might be the clothes that you took off last night. It might be the clothes you're sleeping in from last night. Okay. But every decision does what? Every decision is essentially a doorway. Like, just like this door. You make a decision on what happens. All the other possibilities, all the other opportunities of that decision, gone. Even though, you know, the example I used earlier, I can decide, do I hold this or do I drop it? Now, it's a very trite decision. But if I drop it, that means that's been done. It, I can never go back and change that. Can I do it again? No. Can I do it again for the rest of my life? Pretty stupid thing to do, but yes, I could. Okay. But then you take that and extrapolate to big decisions. What kind of job do I have? Who, if I'm going to, do I want to marry? Or who do I marry? Or should I propose? Or should I not propose? Should I get this car? Should I not get this car? You look at one car, you buy one car, and what does that do to the other cars you were looking at? Invalidates them. Somebody else is now free to buy them. Unless you're filthy rich. Just buy them all. <laughs> <laughs> or unless you live, you know, somewhere marriage-wise, where you don't have to marry just one person, but just marry them all. You know, set up a harem kind of thing. <laughs> For the deeds of a man, not the words of a prophecy, or what shape his destiny. 
The deeds of a man are what shape his destiny. Terry, now I know why you kept my parentage a secret. But shall I never know? Shall I never be given to know it? I did not keep it secret from you entirely through my own wish, nor do I keep it so now. Long ago, when the Book of Three first came into my hands, where did he get it from? Uh, or do you work on The three old ladies, or three gorgeous ladies, whichever one you want to think of them as. From its pages, I learned that when the sons of dawn departed from Perdane, the high king would be one who slew a serpent. Oh, gee. Is there any symbolism there? Yeah, the, the, the devil's snake. Dull. Messianic prophecies from Genesis... Up into the New Testament, okay? He shall bruise your heel, and you shall crush his head. The high king would be one who slew a serpent, who gained and lost a flaming sword. He gained it when? He, uh, like, when he drew it out of the rock. Okay, that's one time. When he became capable of drawing it out. Okay, then... He also gained a win. In the last, or in the first book. In the first book, when he tried to draw it, and it zapped him. Okay. And he lost it. I long we took it, then it goes to Gwydion. But then he gains it again when he draws it from the rock, pulls it from, and then it no longer flames. Okay. Who chose a kingdom of sorrow over a kingdom of happiness. These prophecies were clouded, even to me. In other words, Dalvin says, what the hell is happening? And darkest was the prophecy that he would come to rule Perdane would be one of no station in life. Well, that's not really true. Everybody is of some station. It's just, he's the ground people walk on, essentially. <clears throat> Long did I ponder these things. At last I left Carol Dalvin to seek this reacher king and to hasten his coming. For many years I searched, yet all whom I questioned well knew their station, whether shepherd or war leader, camp of lord or comet farmer. The seasons turned, kings rose and fell, wars turned to peace, peace to war. Indeed, on a certain time, so many years ago as you yourself have years, a grievous war was upon the land, and I despaired of my quest and turned my steps once more toward Caradolvin. And on that day, I chanced to pass a field where a battle had raged. Many lay slain, noble as well as humble folk. Even the women and children had not been spared. And I heard a piercing cry from the forest. An infant had been hidden among the trees, as though his mother had sought at the last to keep him safe. Couldn't judge anything about his parentage. Only since with certainty, both mother and father lay upon that field of the slain. Here surely was one of no station in life. So he'd already read the prophecies. The high king would be one of no station in life. An unknown babe of unknown kin. I bore the child with me to care Dalvin. The name I gave him was Terran. I could not have told you your parentage even had I wished to. For I knew it no more than you did. My secret hope I shared only with two others. Gwydion and Call. So that when Terran meets Gwydion off in the wild, Gwydion already knows who he is. As you grew to manhood, so our hopes grew, though never could we be certain you were the child born to be a high king. Until now, you were always a great, maybe, perhaps, as he puts it. And that's, you know, kind of how parents look at their children. Maybe. This one will rise to greatness. Probably this one will be living with me till I retire. <laughs> Maybe this one will, you know, leave. <laughs> I've got four. There's one more I haven't, you know. But they're all still home. Until now, what is written, Gwydion says, has come to pass. In other words, the book's been written, essentially. Now we've got to leave. And Glue steps forward. And says, I've been carrying this with me ever since I was so shabbily hustled away from Mona. And he puts a crystal into Terran's hand. It reminded me of my cavern and the grand days when I was a giant. But for some reason, I don't want to be reminded of them any longer. Since I don't want it here. <laughs> Notice, you know, 
He's not giving it away out of the generosity of his heart. It's, well, it's junk to me, so here, you take it. Keep it as a remembrance of me. Fluter. He's still hardly the most generous spirit in the world, but I've no doubt it's the first time he's ever given anybody anything. Dolly. Dolly. Then goes up to him. And says, here, you'll need this. And it should serve you well in many, fast, in many tasks. It's fair folk quality, giving Taryn an axe. Taryn, it can serve me no better than did its owner. Its metal cannot be as true as your own heart. Good old Dolly. Call Lens. Call it. Okay. Leanne comes up, rubs her head on Taryn. Says, Taryn gives Leon parting words for Fluter. Fluter comes up. Draw near, hand held the harp string he had taken from the fire. Remember, everything burned but this one string. The heat of the flame had caused the string to curl and twine in a curious pattern that seemed without beginning or end. A Celtic knot, in other words. Right? Constantly changing as from one melody to another. He says, I'm afraid it's all that's left. So he gives it to Taryn. Gurgi says, I don't have anything to give you. And then he remembers, yes, I do. Here, here it is. Page 243 at the top. From burning treasure house of wicked death lord, bold Gurgi seized it with catchings and snatchings. This poor tender head was so filled with fearful spinnings he forgot. And he pulls out of the leather pouch a small, flame-scarred, battered coffer of unknown metal and holds it out to Taryn, who looks at it, studies it, and then he opens it. And he says, do you not realize, do you know what you have found? Here are the secrets of forging and tempering metals, of shaping and firing pottery, of planting and captivating, excuse me, cultivating. This is what Iran stole long ago and kept from the race of men. This is what he needs to rebuild Prudain. Gwydion says, that's probably the most precious of all. The flames of Anuvin destroyed the enchanted tools that labored of themselves and would have given carefree idleness. Notice what Alexander is saying. Doesn't do any good to have a garden that tills itself. Nope. It takes work. These treasures are far worthier for their use needs skill and strength of hand and mind. Fluter, who owns these secrets, is truly master of Pradane. Tear an old friend, the proudest cantor of Lord, will be at your beck and call. Okay. So, Dalvin says, then take this too. Hands him the book. I dare not. What happened last time Terran touched it? Burned his fingers. Take it, my boy. It will not blister your fingers as once it did. All its pages are open to you. The Book of Three no longer foretells what is to come, only what it has been. But now can be set down the words of its last page. Then he opens it, and he turns it to the last blank page, and thus did an assistant pig keeper become High King of Predain. Gwydion merely clasps him in farewell. And Terran says, take Durnwin. Says, no, it's yours, as it was meant to be. Terran, but Iran is slain. Evil is conquered. The blade's work's done. Uh, evil is conquered? Gwydion says, you've learned much, but learn this last and hardest of lessons. You've conquered only the enchantments of evil. That was the easiest of your tasks. Only a beginning, not an ending. Do you believe evil itself to be so quickly overcome? Not so long as men still hate and slay each other. I mean, he still has Gorion and Gast, you know, over in uh, Smoit's cantrip to deal with. When greed and anger goad them, against these even a flaming sword cannot prevail, but only that portion of good in all men's hearts whose flame can never be quenched. What is he talking about? Alexander said, a friend of mine told me this, 
Alexander said somewhere in an interview, he was asked, are these quote-unquote Christian books? And he said, no, they're not. But they are heavily informed by Christian thinking and Christian thought, though he doesn't say that he is, is himself a Christian. The idea here is the image of God, this, this spark of goodness that cannot be quenched. Okay? Finally, our lonely comes up to him. She gives him her bauble. Take this. Does not glow as brightly as the love we might have shared. <laughs> That's a, you know, she takes it and hits him with the pipe, you know, right between the ribs and just kind of twists it in the heart. Farewell. Remember me when you're lying alone in your cold bed in the middle of winter or curled up to some smelly pig. It's not fair. It's not my fault I was born into a family of enchantresses. I didn't ask for magical powers. It's worse than being made to wear a parachute that doesn't fit. Dalvin says, finally, finally, do you really wish to give up your heritage of enchantment? Yes, of course. You can do that. That ring you wear, the gift of Lord Gwydion gave you long ago will grant your wish. What? Do you mean to say all the years I've worn my ring, I could have used it to have a wish granted? You told me nothing. That's the, I could simply have wished to destroy the Black Cauldron or to find Dornwin. I could have wished Iran conquered. He says, child, child, your ring can indeed grant you a wish, one wish. Evil cannot be conquered by wishing. Notice what she said there. I could have wished Iran away. No. The ring will only serve will serve only you and grant only the deepest wish of your own heart. Didn't tell you before, because I wasn't certain that you truly knew what you longed for. So, what is it you want, Ilanwe? He's standing right there. <laughs> Turn the ring once upon your finger, wish with all your heart for your enchanted powers to vanish. She does. The bobble light dies out. And Dalvin says. Yes, your enchantments are gone. You shall always keep the magic and mystery all women share. And I fear that Terran, like all men, shall be often baffled by it. In other words, he's going to wish he had a magic ring that said, What the hell does she mean? <laughs> but such is the way of it. They get married. They pledge their troth. Okay? And Taryn asks, 247, just before the very end, we won't even get into wrinkle in time today. We'll just leave early. He asks, as they leave the, the um, cottage, can one such as I rule a kingdom? I remember a time when I jumped headfirst into a thorn bush, and I fear kingship will be no different. Ilanri, probably more nettlesome. That is, it'll be more painful. But should you have any difficulties, I'll be happy to give you my advice. Right now, there's only one question. Are you going in or going out of the story? Okay. Terran sees Heaven, Lasser, the Folk of the Comets, Gas, Gorion, side by side. Near the farmer, Aiden, King Smoit, towering above them, his beard bright as flame. These are people that have come. But he also sees faces that he only sees with his heart. They get married, and we conclude. And so they lived many happy years, and the promised tasks were accomplished. He builds the seawall, he digs the garden, the red fallows is now fertile land. Yet long afterward, when all had passed away into distant memory, there were many who wondered whether King Terran, and Queen Ailanwi and their companions had indeed walked the earth, or whether they had been no more than dreams in a tale set down to beguile children. And in time, only the bards knew of it. What does beguile mean? It's a trick. Is it to trick? Or is it to enchant? Or charm. Or charm. Okay, we'll stop there. We'll pick up Wrinkle in Time on whatever day that is. Tuesday. Um...
Yeah, expect a quiz. This reads pretty fast. Uh, the whole thing. Oh, that's confusing. <laughs> Some of it's confusing, yeah. Well, wait till you get to the others. <laughs> yeah, my fiance is like, you're going to have to read over some of them quite a few times before you get them. Have a good weekend. You too. Have a good weekend. Thank you, you too. Um, I think we need to talk about the quiz that you're going to let me read. Oh, which one was that? Was that the one I just handed back? Yeah, I think so. Okay, let's... Yeah, because I completely forgot about that. Um, tell you what, just do it on Tuesday. Because, I mean, unless you wrote all the answers down, which I no. think you would have. So. Yeah. I didn't. Like, I'll I, just let you know. honestly, I would have told you, like, before class, but I thought that you had already, like, done it and went over it. No, my brain's so mixed up because this cold stuff's coming back. Okay, cool. See you on Tuesday. All right.